I'm going to use overcoming adversity, and I'm going to give you like one of the methods or tools that I use to help me overcome adversity in my professional career. So some backstory. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Port McGee. I'm 34 years old. I've been married uh, maybe 11 years at the end of this month, but I've been together with my wife uh, for 19 years, minus one year, uh, which I don't really remember much of that year. Yeah. Um, I was born in uh, Ogden, Utah. I grew up in Layton, Utah. I have two sons. One's 12 and one turns nine tomorrow. Uh, outside of that, I've, my parents have been married for 40 years. They're loving, kind, hardworking. Um, and outside of that, uh, I'll share a little bit about my experience in mixed martial arts and kind of the purpose of my topic. But um, I have roughly 11,000 hours of training. Uh, so that's 26 to 27 years of uh, like competition and time on the mat. Um, I have experience in folk style wrestling, I have a black belt in Taekwondo, a Shintoshi Karate, and a fourth degree black belt in Hawaiian Kempo under John Hackleman. Uh, I have experience in folk style wrestling, and I've com competed in uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in a gi and no gi competition. I've had about a, over 100 competition Jiu Jitsu matches, about 30 tournaments. And then in folk style wrestling, I had over 100 competition matches as well. Um, I was a multiple time state placer in Utah and a national title holder in high school. Um, overcoming adversity, some of the adversity I uh, faced in my career and in my life outside of that, um, I'm severely dyslexic. I was diagnosed uh, with attention deficit disorder. So my capacity to read was relatively low, under the fourth grade level, speed and comprehension, yet my vocabulary was adversely high. Um, and I didn't get diagnosed that until after I achieved uh, sobriety and kind of restarted my life over at age 21. I didn't read a book cover to cover until I was 25 years old, um, and that was very challenging. One of the other issues that I had was I did graduate high school with uh, as a commended graduate, so top in my class. I was offered a full ride scholarship and then lost it because of Title IX, women's, men's fairness and sports, um, which partially led to my substance abuse. Um, outside of that, I'm a person in long-term recovery. Today, I have uh, 4,913 days of sobriety, so just over, well, over 13 years of continuous sobriety. So recovery from all mood-altering and mind-altering substances including prescription pain pills and benzodiazepines, which usually you take through uh, surgeries. Um, I've been through seven major surgeries in the nine years I've been in the UFC, and I haven't taken uh, any mind-altering substances for any of those seven major surgeries, other than the drugs that they put me under with. So I didn't leave the hospital with narcotics. I stayed in if I needed to, or I went home and uh, toughed it out. So the first story that I'm kind of going to talk about and the story that I'm going to relate my topic to is I had a lot of adversity. Um, me and my wife, our families, uh, that was a challenge. She left me um, after us being together for four years. Uh, it, and it was because of my drug addiction. Um, I lost my scholarship because of Title IX, Women and Men's Fairness in Sports, and so I wasn't able to go to college and wrestle in Division I college. And the year I graduated, they acquitted every single program in the state of Utah. So there was no colleges for me to wrestle in. And my dream was to wrestle as a Division I athlete because I saw a documentary called Mark Kerr, The Smashing Machine when I was 11 years old. And when I saw that, I thought that's what I needed to do. I needed to become the baddest motherfucker I knew because at age five, I got left and I was left at an amusement park by an aunt and uncle. I became fearful of everything and everybody, and my parents stopped putting me into martial arts would help my self-confidence and help me take care of fear and the issues that I was having. Now, that led to a 27 years of mixed martial arts experience, minus one season of t-ball when I was six years old. So outside of that, this is the only thing I know. I've competed as an amateur and professional boxer, uh, I never did compete in kickboxing, but jiu-jitsu, wrestling, 
and my last 30 fights have been in mixed martial arts. My last 19 fights have been in the UFC and the Ultimate Fighter House. This will be my 20th fight with the organization. Um, I fought some of the best athletes in the world, but the story that I want to stick to is my first fight in the UFC. So after making it onto the Ultimate Fighter, I had one son out of wedlock and I was broke. I quit a full-time job to pursue a career and become a professional athlete, like a lot of you are going through right now. And I worked. I cleaned mats 20 hours a week at the gym. I taught private lessons. I taught classes. I sold supplements and ran our supplement shop. I sold knockoff clothes and I did plumbing side work for one of my students who owned a bunch of commercial properties like this, installing roof drains and repairing things. And so I worked my ass off and I had lots of challenges. I got my shot and made it onto the Ultimate Fighter and I wasn't going to do it. I wasn't going to do it because I was worried about the alcohol in the house, me being a person in long-term recovery, and I was worried if I went on and I won the show and it became a professional athlete, I thought, holy shit, I can't deal with that type of stress. I would make more money than I'd ever made before. All of a sudden, I'd be famous. There'd be girls. There'd be all the stuff you think a professional athlete is. And so I was scared to death. I said no. And then one of my spiritual advisors and one of the people I look up to most said, Court, do you think your story could help people by you making it on that show and sharing with them your experience of overcoming addiction? And I was like, man, millions of people will see it. So I decided to go. I went, I ended up uh, winning. My last fight was against Brad Tavares to get me into the finale, the guy that Ian was supposed to fight a week after me. Um, I finished him in the third round, caught him with the hook, took him down, took his back, choked him unconscious with a rear naked choke, and I went into the finale. I came home, and my wife, she met me at the airport. She said, I've got some exciting news for you, and I was like, for you? I had 600 bucks in my pocket, because Dana White, after you get done with the show, takes you to a strip club. So he took me to a strip club. Now with some past experiences and some of my personal experiences, I dated a stripper in the few years I was using drugs. And it was not pleasant and I didn't like strip clubs. So when I went to the strip club, I didn't want to be rude to Dana White. So he gave me $1,100 in chips or maybe $1,000 in chips. And one of the girls was talking to me, asked me where I was from, asked me if I wanted to dance. And I said, no, no, thank you. But I tried to keep it cool because Dana was sitting next to me and Chuck Liddell and Tito and the whole group of everybody and all the fighters and I was supposed to be having fun and I wasn't. I just wanted to get home. And I was excited because I knew I had won and I was in the finale. So what I did is I talked to this girl and she was very nice and I said, hey listen, if I give you a thousand dollars in chips, like what do you make in two hours? And she was like, well I'm making about 400 bucks. I said, well I'll pay you 400 dollars but I'll give you thousand dollars in chips if you give me 600 bucks back if you just stay here and keep me company and make it look like we're having fun she's like oh okay and so we talked about her life and then after the night was over she gave me 600 dollars cash she walked home with 400 i had 600 bucks in my pocket and when i met my wife at the airport when i landed i said man i got 600 bucks i made it into the finale i got three finished thousand dollars and finished like fight night finish bonuses and then I made about a thousand bucks a week or 500 bucks a week while I was there. And I'm like, man, isn't that exciting? And she said, yeah, well, I'm pregnant. And before I made it or thought I was going on the show, I told my wife we couldn't have another kid because I didn't make enough money and I could not financially support another mouth. I just couldn't do it. And I didn't have the bandwidth and I thought it wouldn't be right. And so when I found out I made it on the show and decided to go, we decided to try the night before I left. So we tried. When I came home, she said, I'm pregnant. And I'm like, holy shit, wow. And so I was in the finale, I was pregnant at 600 bucks, and then I ended up making three grand while I was in the house. And I'm like, holy shit, I can just focus on training. Some of the adversity was my coach at the time was a scumbag, and he left and stole a bunch of money from the gym, so I no longer had a coach. So I called Chuck Liddell, my coach from the show, and said, hey dude, I really don't have a coach and I should probably be training for this fight like UFC fighter trains. So he booked a flight and uh, let me stay in his house for six weeks leading up to the fight. He flew my wife out on one occasion and my oldest son. It was incredible. I trained side by side with Chuck for his last fight in the UFC and my first fight in the UFC. Two weeks before the fight happened, 
my wife uh, went into labor. Now, he was premature two weeks, and he was born with pneumonia and a bunch of other problems and was in the NICU. So the last two weeks of my training camp, which essentially would be like this week and next week, the, there was three weeks till the fight. So the last two hard weeks of my training camp, I was in the ER in the NICU with my son. This was my big opportunity. This was my fight. This was my chance. It was a UFC 121. There was a lot of hype on it. And I was fighting Anthony Smith's coach at the time, uh, Ryan Jensen. And he had like 21 first round finishes. And he'd had a long career in the UFC, like six or seven years. So he was a seasoned veteran. He'd fought four or five guys that had fought for the title. I mean, the dude is tough as nails. If you have any questions, ask Anthony how badass he was. So that was my first fight. And I knew I wasn't properly prepared. I wasn't getting enough rest, but I didn't. I just burned the boats. I was ready to fight no matter what. And my coach at the time, John Hackelman, came and stayed in the hospital with me. So we trained in the hospital. We would leave, we'd go to practice, come back to the hospital, and he stayed with me most times. And it, like, it moved me. So I showed up to UFC 121, and we had our pre-fight interviews and all the big highlights of hoopla, because the finale wasn't like that. It was a small venue in the Palms. This was UFC 121, it was at the Honda Center. I mean, there was you know, 15,000 people there. It was incredible. I had all these interviews, all this stuff. And then all the shit talking came, and he was a shit talker. And that's exactly what he did. Face to face, he told me, I'm better than you in striking, which he had more professional boxing matches than me and more amateur. So technically, on paper, he was a better boxer than me. He said, I'm a better wrestler. And he was. I believe he was a T2 uh, Division II uh, college wrestler, and he wrestled and had competition at the Division I. And on paper, and in competition, he was better than me at wrestling. And he said, I'm a black belt in jiu-jitsu. And I smashed dudes. I got a top game like this guy's never, ever, ever felt. Technically, he was ranked higher than me. And so I was pissed. And I didn't say anything back because I'm not a good shit talker. <laughs> I was just fucking stewing like this. You know, but on the other side, you know what, man, he really, it's true. He is, and he's got a ton more experience than me. Like, what the fuck? And I was just, I was just losing my shit. Kind of like we do on Fight Club. And so I called my spiritual advisor, my friend Dave. And I was like, man, this son of a bitch, he said this, he said this, he said that. <laughs> and this is the method that I'm giving to you and that you guys can use. I was angry. And he said, Court, you're not angry. He said, you're in fear. And through past experiences working with him, I understood what he meant. I did have fear. Number one, I didn't want to let my family down. This is my first big fight in the UFC. That guy was telling the truth. Technically, he was better than me. But some of those fears were irrational. My family weren't let down. My training partners, a lot of you guys like you are right now, are training partners to me. You're not let down if I go out, do my best, and I lose. If you know I gave it everything I got. You're disappointed that I didn't get my extra paycheck or you're disappointed if I get hurt. But if I lose, you don't care. Not if you're my true friend. My family wouldn't be let down. I was worried financially because I was getting paid $15,000 guaranteed to walk into that fight. And it had cost me $7,000 to get there. And I had to pay 10% to a coach, 10% to a manager. And I mean, I set aside 15% for taxes. That's less than two grand. That's less than I made at my best when I fought outside of the UFC. My biggest payday outside of the UFC was $3,000. I thought, what the fuck? I made it here and this is all I'm gonna get? I hadn't even fought yet. So my friend Dave, he said, all right, I want you to write down your fears. So I wrote down my fears. And on that list of fears, I was rational and irrational. And more than half of those fears were irrational. And he said, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. And I know everybody like has different beliefs, but I believe in a, in a, a, a higher power. And so what I do is I ask the higher power to remove those irrational thoughts, remove those irrational fears, and direct my attention to what I need to do. Fear is a good motivator. Kind of like uh, I had a friend growing up whose dad was involved in a car accident. Now, he was wearing a seatbelt. Had he not wore the seatbelt, he would have been okay. And I don't know how they deemed that, but that was the case. 
So for his whole life, he decided not to wear a seatbelt. Now, how many people die not wearing a seatbelt versus people who wear a seatbelt? When that kid came to me talking about how his wife was pissed because he wouldn't wear a seatbelt and they had a daughter, I said, listen, bro, that is completely irrational. What are the chances you're going to get in a wreck and not wear a seatbelt and survive because of your dad's experience versus wearing a seatbelt because it's a whole lot better of an idea? And he's like, yeah, you're right. And I'm like, well, maybe I'd pray about it. Ask whatever high power you believe in to remove that stupid ass fear and help you do what you need to do, which is this. For us, maybe it's uh, drinking water, getting on weight. Maybe it's listening to our coach, practicing the principles that we practice in here, practicing moves, showing up on time, staying a little bit late, drilling those extra moves making sure we go to bed a little bit earlier instead of watching the stupid series we're watching, whatever it may be, I had to designate that. And so what I did is I said, you know what, a lot of these fears are irrational. And I asked my higher power to remove them. I went out and my striking was just good enough to catch him with a left hook. Matter of fact, it was sponsored, right? My wrestling was just good enough to catch him with a double leg, clear his hips, and land on his butt. And my jujitsu was just good enough to pass his guard, get into mount, arm triangle, and finish him with a submission. And that was my first fight in the UFC. Now some of the other adversity was the second punch in the fight thrown was an overhand right. And I'm talking loopy Chuck Liddell overhand right. And I hit him on top of the head and I shattered my second metacarpal. So my hand was broke for the entirety of the fight. It was the only fight I wore contacts. In the first round of that fight, I was taken down. And I looked over and I saw Will Smith and Jada Pinkett. And I went, holy shit. <laughs> Will Smith is watching me fight. <laughs> and then I went, oh shit, I'm in a fight. And I stood back up. Now, from now, I don't wear contacts and I haven't worn contacts from that fight. So I learned that I used it as a lesson. But also too, I got those fears taken away by a higher power that I believe in trusting. And I built that relationship over a long period of time. You guys can use that method. Distinguish whether or not it's a rational or irrational fear. And if it's irrational, have whatever higher power you believe in, remove it or tell a friend or even write it down. And if it is rational, like I'm scared I'm not gonna get a good enough warm up in, talk to your coach and make sure you get a good warm up in because that can help you achieve better results when you're in competition. One thing you can't do is teach heart. You either have it or you don't. And I'm telling you right now, sometimes you can find it. I've had a lot of experiences in fights where I wanted out. I thought, this is my ticket out. Nobody will know I quit. I'm just gonna drop my hand so I can get caught on the chin and knocked out. And then boom, that comes and I'm not knocked out. And I go, oh, shit. I'm in it for the fight, right? So if you don't have it or you're questioning it, don't. Show up, do your best. Um, courage is not the absence of fear, it's the ability to walk forward in the face of it. Which is a great quote, but that's not always the case. Sometimes some of those fears are completely irrational. If I had a bunch of extra time and money, I would come up with a shirt saying, I have 99 fears, right? and like 98 of them are completely irrational and made up in my head. Cause like, that's how it is. So a lot of those fears need to be removed. We're fear-based people. We make a lot of choices based on fear and sometimes the choices we don't make withhold us, withhold us from becoming the people we know we should be. So that's all I got, thanks.